Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Ramona. I'm the sales executive for Coral Expeditions. Um, so I will actually have the pleasure of uh, two of our fantastic expedition team who are going to be joining me today as well. Um, so I've been with the company though for a couple of years now. Um, I'm based in Cairns, so up in uh, tropical North Queensland, where we actually have our office and um, our home base. So we started out um, from humble beginnings up here in Cairns or Townsville um, around 35 years ago. Um, so we've been cruising um, for around 35 years now. We actually celebrate our 35 years this year. Um, and our main purpose since the beginning has been to take groups of um, like-minded explorers to all of those little remote parts of the world that most people don't get the opportunity to see. Um, so we like to do that with um, our warm Australian hospitality. So the majority of our crew are um, Australian and we are Australian flagged vessels as well. So that's got a lot of bonuses, but um, one of them is that we're actually not required to go into international waters. So we spend a whole lot more time actually exploring all of the fantastic uh, locations that um, Australia has to offer. Um, so one of those fantastic destinations is actually Cape York and Arnhem Land. Um, so this is a destination that is uh, very close to um, our expedition team's heart. Um, and I'm actually going to hand you over now to our expedition leaders uh, very soon. And they're going to talk to you about this region of um, Cape York and Arnhem Land. So, so I'm now I'm going to hand you over to our expedition team. So we've got Jamie. Um, so feel free to jump in and tell everyone a bit about yourself, Jamie. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm Jamie Anderson and uh, I've been with the company now 19 years. Uh, I've been travelling up along the East Coast and uh, spent a lot of time in uh, Cape York uh, and uh, worked there for five years. And uh, since then, I've been uh, working with the company and taking people all the way across to Darwin and further uh, afield. Uh, it's a great place to visit, very different from uh, Kimberley and any but where else. And then uh, over to you, Ian. I'm sure you've got some great stories to share as well. Yeah, hi folks. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, my background basically is on um, the Arnhem region. Uh, I, I started uh, over there in Arnhem Land as a school teacher uh, very early in, uh, in my career, working in Indigenous schools. And uh, I think I did more learning than the kids that I was supposed to be teaching. And uh, it's a very exciting place. These people have a different world that they live in. And uh, these days, uh, I enjoy sharing that world with uh, our guests on our, on our trips. Um, I also spend about uh, 12, 12 years in Kakadu National Park and in the early days I was with part of a marsupial research team that worked around the Iron Range Cooktown area on some of our little known marsupials up there. So uh, I, I just love North Australia and its ecology and on this trip uh, particularly you will meet its people um, which, which are the most exciting aspect of the whole lot in many ways. Blizzard Island is uh, uh, one of the areas that we uh, visit it has uh, uh, an incredible place to uh, uh, protect it, anchorage, and uh, gives us the ideal opportunity to uh, do some snorkeling uh, in sheltered waters. It gives us a chance to do a dive. It gives us a chance to walk uh, along the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the landscape. We get magnificent views from places like Cook's Look, a strenuous walk, but certainly well worth it once you get up the top. The, the snorkeling, as I said, is just brilliant. Uh, and uh, you have a chance to have a look at a myriad of, of fish species, clams and uh, the like. The other good thing about Lizard Island is all the things we observe above and below the water level, uh, we get a chance to uh, find out about them at the research station there. So we, wherever we can, we go and visit the research station and learn uh, what, their, what their latest research is telling us. It's fantastic. Yeah, Lizard Island uh, is one of those great locations too if you're just starting out diving for the first time because it is quite shallow um, wanting to do an optional uh, dive. That is something that we do offer. Um, great place to check that out. Oh, actually, can't, can't leave behind those beautiful sunsets too. That's um, a great <laughs> yeah. We always have a, a sunset beverage or um, where we can take in a nice little afternoon barbecue. 
This is Danny, and Danny's a, a, um, a traditional owner of uh, this particular area, which is the Flinders Group of Islands. In this particular case, uh, Stanley Island. And uh, uh, we are guided around these magnificent uh, uh, art sites. It's an occupational site. Danny's knowledge is, ne is next to none. It, it really is quite spectacular. He talks about the plants, he talks about the medicines, and he talks about the art. Uh, he has a great sense of humour and uh, he loves explaining this to guests. Yeah, part of his role too is to uh, teach the younger Indigenous uh, people along the coast uh, to be able to impart their knowledge. Um, and uh, that generally shy people, our Indigenous people on the whole. Danny, however, is, uh, is really, really good at getting the message across uh, about Indigenous Australia and how it works and how they're all linked up and, and yet how they're all different and their languages vary and their stories vary. So Danny, yeah, he just loves, loves teaching us and telling us about the real Australia. So it's a privilege to have a guy like him with us. And he will travel with us all the way to the top. Mm. So we also have uh, uh, the different areas uh, are always uh, um, amazing. You can get these wonderful lookouts of uh, uh, Flinders Island, which is the uh, right hand, uh, the left hand side top. Uh, you have uh, uh, the Wongo Plum uh, on the, the right side there. Um, it said if you taste one of those, you will always come back to Torres Strait. And I don't know, Ian and I have had a number of them, we keep on going back. So it works uh, for us. Uh, it works for us. Uh, we've also, of course, got mangrove areas and uh, we've got uh, some incredible uh, rock formation, uh, ledges and, and the like uh, in very, very beautiful uh, uh, crystal clear waters. The, uh, the marine organisms on the barrier reef are very complex and there's a multitude of them, but the places we go to usually both the fish and the turtles and the other the marine creatures, they get used to us. And uh, sometimes it's even, I, I swam along on top of that turtle and uh, he took me for a bit of a cruise of his reef and he was quite happy to have my company. And those little experiences are amazing and our, our guests uh, usually are enthralled with what they see in places like uh, uh, Lizard Island and some of the outer reef areas where we, we stop on. Um, and, the, and we notice the animals are getting more and more used to um, the right sort of people, people who just want to join in with them and take photos and, and learn about them. So that's one of the great aspects of this particular trip up the east coast of the Cape York Peninsula is seeing all these unique and beautiful things. This is Davy Kay and, and Davy Kay is, is uh, uh, special because you can actually walk on it and have a look at the bird life. Forbes Island is a continental island rather than a uh, Kay. And uh, uh, formed many years ago and of course uh, uh, has a, a lot of terrestrial and also uh, marine critters. And you get the chance to walk uh, up uh, the hills here, have a look at some of the vegetation, which is always extremely uh, beautiful. You quite often in flower. Uh, and of course the reef itself gives you uh, uh, a myriad of species uh, to have a look at. Uh, you have the, uh, the anemone fish, you have uh, shoals of, uh, uh, of um, mullet. Uh, you also have uh, uh, this wonderful place where you can actually sit on the beach. You don't have to do anything, uh, but you can kayak. Uh, we have a glass bottom boat, which uh, uh, will uh, quite often be utilized. Uh, and that's, uh, that's important for those people who can't uh, snorkel or don't wish to snorkel. And of course, you get magnificent views from up on the top of the hills, looking down into the bay at Forbes Island. The reef is there, right on the edge. Mm. And Forbes is, is, uh, was once part of the mainland of Cape York uh, until the last sea level rise. And now it's a, a bunch of hills surrounded by the ocean. And they're granite hills. And we do get a chance to walk up and, and look at these rather remarkable, uh, they call them continental islands. Uh, quite different to the reefs and caves and other types of islands that we visit later in the trip. But Forbes is, is quite unique, an isolated bit of the mainland. And there's quite a few birds and, and other species there that are normally only found on the mainland, but they are able to live on Forbes. So we often do little uh, walks off into the forest and over the hills and, and uh, have a look at some of these things.
of course, one of the iconic uh, plot stops is uh, Cape York, and uh, um, quite often in the uh, on the way across, it uh, is done at uh, sunrise, and then uh, coming from uh, Cairns back uh, from uh, Darwin back, uh, it might be the sunset. But it doesn't really matter when you get uh, uh, to Cape York. It's the meeting of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And you have these uh, incredible tracks through the uh, rocks. You get views of Eberak Island and York Island off the tip of Australia, the most northern tip. You get a chance to stand by a sign that actually tells you this. And with a little bit of luck, you've got a chance to go and have a look at some of the semi deciduous um, monsoon vine forests that are around the, uh, the edge of the uh, tip. And uh, it's a very, very special place. The beach, beaches are uh, very, very beautiful, either high tide or low tide. In times past, our, uh, our continent of Australia was connected to New, New Guinea and some of the islands of Eastern Indonesia even. Um, and of course, today with our high sea level, um, we've been isolated. But a lot of our plants and indeed a lot of our animals and uh, birds uh, are connected. Uh, by those old former sea levels and the continuity of the Australian New Guinea continent. And, uh, and today it's a bit of a flyway. So often when we're walking around, we see flocks of birds coming down along the Torres Strait Islands and into Australia as part of their annual migra migration. And uh, we, we see a lot of unique things there as well. So it's, um, it's well worth having those binoculars on your side when you're in that area. And of course, in the early part of the season, Ian, you see them flying back over to New Guinea. Mm. Thursday Island, of course, is part of Torres Strait and uh, uh, we usually make a stop uh, at Thursday Island. Magic views from up on the top of the, uh, uh, of the uh, hill at the museum, the War Museum. And uh, it's also got a pearling museum there as well. You get, um, uh, as you can see, you can uh, get uh, beautiful views of the uh, all the channels that are going through in the islands around Thursday Island. You get an opportunity to uh, spend some time having a look around Thursday Island, which is the administration centre to, uh, to Torres Strait. And you've got uh, the church, uh, which is the Quetta Church. Uh, there was a disaster in 1890 uh, where a large number of people lost their lives. I think it was around 130 uh, plus. And uh, this was set up for uh, uh, as a memorial to that particular disaster. The people of uh, Torres Strait are very, very different. They're, they're very different from the Aboriginals on the uh, mainland. And uh, so their dance styles are very different. That's always interesting uh, watching that. And of course, you, for some strange reason, you can't go past the cemeteries. The cemetery on, in Thursday Island or in Torres Strait are very, very colorful. Uh, beautifully put together and the headstones are, are just something to uh, uh, to be uh, very, very proud of. And as we come up Cape York Peninsula and learn all our Aboriginal culture from people like Danny Gordon, uh, we go across to Thursday Island a few kilometres and we're in another culture. Um, and these are Melanesian people, they're not, not Aboriginal people. Completely, as Jamie said, completely different culture. Um, and another way of looking at the same kind of territory. So uh, that's one of the fascinating aspects of this particular trip is moving from one culture to another. And, uh, and of course, their cassowary feathers that the boys are got on their headdresses. Um, and they're linked again to the, the natural species on the mainland. And, and that's the exciting part. We learn how all these things interact and how these people have managed this country for so long and interacted with it. It's amazing. Yeah, we am. Um, now we've crossed the Gulf of Carpentaria. We're in an, another cultural zone altogether. These are Aboriginal people again. This is a, a place called Yirikala on the Gove Peninsula. And uh, we call in there and visit their wonderful art centre. They have probably one of the best art centres in Australia. And we're able to view all their amazing art. But we also get to walk around. Um, famous Australians like Nugget Coombs, the old governor of the Reserve Bank, he, uh, his remains are there on the point, along with uh, memorials to the Aboriginal people who were involved in the Second World War and, uh, and a particular incident there where uh, the first Australian uh, prisoner of war uh, taken from mainland Australia uh, is commemorated there. He was uh, an old missionary, uh, much loved by the Aboriginal people. 
So there's a lot of all sorts of history at Irkala. Um, and again, beautiful coastline. We're now on the top northeast corner of the Northern Territory and we're in Yulungal land, if you like. We're going to be cruising along towards Darwin to the west and visiting all these different people and different beautiful uh, natural structures as well. And of course, Yirrkala is, uh, uh, is very special from the point of view of the art site uh, or the art gallery. Uh, it's probably, I would say, the best art gallery uh, and the centre of art in Arnhem Land. Uh, and uh, uh, absolutely magnificent. We move from uh, the northeast corner of the Gove Peninsula up into the Wessel Islands, which were again a little mountain range that in the old days at low sea levels would connect us with mainland New Guinea. Today it's a chain of islands about 100 nautical miles long, absolutely remote and beautiful. So we get a chance to go ashore, we go through a pretty scary place called the Hole in the Wall between two of the big islands and uh, we get a chance to go on to some of the remotest coastline in, in North Australia. And this is one of those places, the hole in the wall here, called Marnduna by the Aboriginal people. And our ship is just small enough to be able to get through. And th these are the sort of sights we see with this old, old sandstone. And this magnificent layered uh, marching bar sandstones are, are quite incredible. They, they give you protection and give uh, animals and birds uh, uh, protection. So you quite often see uh, a lot of bird life uh, wandering along the ledges, and also, of course, a lot of the uh, a lot of the eagles uh, sitting on the top, just keeping an eye on the waters. Again, more of our beautiful remote coastlines. This is this is on Ilko Island now, um, which is one of the base uh, or mainland islands of the Wessel Chain, and there's an Aboriginal community there called Gullywinkor. And uh, we get the privilege of going ashore and meeting the Gullywinkle gang and again looking at their different art styles. Their languages are different even from the ones on the stop before at Yirrkala. Their languages vary enormously and so do their lifestyles and their cultural attributes. So it becomes apparent as we travel along the, uh, the top of the Northern Territory that it's not just one race of people. It's a whole lot of different cultures all welded into to, to one big area. So we get a chance to actually meet these people and hear these cultural differences and see how they live their lives. We also, uh, we love uh, going to the art gallery here. Uh, there is uh, some very, very special artists uh, who quite often come and explain and give the stories of, uh, of their art. And there's always a story to the art that they, uh, uh, they paint we get the chance to uh, again talk with the, the ladies uh, as they uh, produce these wonderful uh, um, straw mats if you like and made with pandanus and, and the like and they show you how the dyeing is is done and how it's ground uh, into these wonderful colors and of course if we get that opportunity we take the kids for a bit of a swirl in the explorer and they uh, are always excited we take them out to show them the, uh, uh, the, the mother vessel and uh, they have a lot of fun. You can hear the squeals from miles away. One of the, uh, the interesting and remote little communities that we visit uh, is at a place on the very northern end of Elko Island. You can see down there in the bottom left, just a little community back in behind the sand dunes and it's called Gawa. And at Gawa, they have a quite a unique school. And uh, people from other parts of Arnhem Land will send their children to their school because it's got such a good uh, academic uh, reputation, I guess, in northeastern Arnhem Land. You see a little airstrip in the bush behind there. And we get a chance to go through the school and meet the students and their teachers and their traditional owners who are guiding them in their curriculum and uh, just find out a little bit about who they are and, and a very, very remote lifestyle. And they, they just love meeting our guests. And the, the, the three little kids on the beach, they're holding up the, the banner there, which says Gululu. Gululu is their word for welcome. Um, and they love having us. And uh, they don't like us going when we're finished. Uh, they'd rather if we stayed with them. Uh, but a unique little community. And of course, Aboriginal people up there, they were small community people. They didn't have big towns and cities. They were well dispersed around on their country in small groups and came together only for ceremony at certain times of the year. So a different way of looking at Australia altogether, really. Manangrita is, uh, is another uh, uh, area on the coast of uh, Arnhem Land. Uh, 
It's on the mouth of the Liverpool River. The art centre here is a new art centre and, uh, and it's very, very special uh, from the point of view of, uh, of going in and learning how many of the uh, art pieces are formed, painted, uh, made. And uh, Doris here is uh, uh, just showing us how uh, you make these wonderful uh, mats uh, which uh, adorn the, uh, uh, the area inside the Mangreda Art Centre. Of course, it too is a, is a massive centre for, uh, uh, for people to come from uh, uh, all over Australia. Um, and they fly in and they spend a day there and they buy up big. And uh, certainly it is beautiful uh, uh, work. Uh, we have different uh, areas there. You can see once again that uh, we have uh, the kids coming out to join us. Uh, that's always very, very important. Uh, they love to talk to, to uh, uh, the guests and to the guest lecturers and uh, expedition leader. And uh, it's always um, interesting to try and talk their language, uh, which usually Ian or somebody else has an opportunity to try and teach us. A great experience, I must say. Then there's the early European history. Uh, and what you're looking at there is, is uh, the third failed settlement uh, where the early British colonists in, in the Eastern Australia tried to set up um, settlements in the North Australia uh, as sort of trade centres. And, and they weren't very good at it. Um, they didn't want to be like the Aborigines who were very successful at living in this environment. And as a result, uh, at least four of these settlements in a row failed uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, and the Aboriginal people were sitting comfortably around them, uh, having been there for thousands of years. So we go to these places and we hear these stories of how they tried to set up, set up trade, trade settlements in Northern Australia and, and build another Singapore perhaps, um, and all ended up in, uh, in failure. And whereas today, our, our city of Darwin, just down the road, um, is the opposite, it's doing extremely well. But it's because we've adapted to, us, to Northern Australia. So we get a chance to visit this place called Victoria Settlement on the Coburg Peninsula, um, heading west towards Darwin and uh, hearing these amazing stories and seeing the old architecture from places like Cornwall in England. Um, so yeah, this is another historical aspect of the trip, European history in this case. But at least this one lasted 11 years, Ian. Now, most of them didn't last that long at all. That's right. Black Point is uh, at the top end of, uh, of uh, Port Essington and uh, uh, once we've visited uh, Victoria Settlement we usually make our way up to uh, Black Point. Get a chance to land here and have a look at a, a very interesting little museum that's been uh, prepared by uh, National Parks uh, there and it certainly gives you the details not only of Port Essington but or of uh, Victoria Settlement but also uh, uh, of the Macassans that used to come into this area uh, and uh, down on the uh, uh, left uh, uh, bottom there you'll notice some uh, plates, some what look like woks and they are Macassan bowls. These are the cooking bowls and uh, so there's a lot of information for about the Macassans and of course the Macassans met up with the, the local indigenous uh, tribes and they spent a lot of time imparting knowledge to one another. The storm activities that you get around Black Point are always very, very impressive at the beginning and at the end of the uh, uh, dry season. And uh, uh, there's plenty of walking to be able to be done uh, around Black Point. They have uh, a lagoon there. If it's had a good wet season, then you've got bird life everywhere. If you've got a dry season, then you might not have so many birds, but you may have plenty of lizards and maybe green tree snakes and the like. Uh, so it's always an impressive place to go and have a visit. A great place to have uh, drinks uh, of a night and see the sunsets as well. And prior to, uh, to European arrival in the early 1800s, uh, we had uh, Indonesian groups coming and harvesting marine resources along the northern Australian coast and interacting with the Aboriginal traditional owners. And there was quite a trade was going on for we think up to nearly a thousand years between uh, Southern Indonesia and Northern Australia. And those little woks there, those little bowls in the bottom left, they're, uh, 
they're the sort of thing that the Macassan traders used to boil their trepang, the, the sea slugs that they wanted to collect uh, up on the shoreline before stacking them in their boats. And they would end up as far away as China uh, on the trade, trade links. The Tiwi Islands are, uh, are again, completely different uh, to the uh, Aboriginal side of things and the Torres Strait uh, uh, people. They're, um, uh, they're wonderful kids. The art is, is quite impressive. Uh, and uh, this is a place where you get a chance to have a look at uh, some of the great uh, design work that uh, these people uh, uh, impart. Uh, we uh, have guided tours of uh, New Yu. Uh, it now has uh, a very impressive Aboriginal name, or a Tiwi Island name, I should say, and uh, uh, which is about as long as your arm. But um, certainly the, the guides are, uh, uh, are very, very enthusiastic and uh, bombastic, and uh, they love imparting the knowledge about uh, their community. They, they combine traditional and modern techniques too. So you can see they've got magnificent screen printing uh, facilities there for doing great big uh, lengths of material with their traditional designs in a very modern way. And it's very popular all over the world, that particular type of screen printing. So um, that's one of their main uh, dependent industries these days. And uh, so, yeah, again, a mix of uh, traditional and modern um, techniques there, the shells that they paint, and Tadeus there in the top left, he's teaching us about their moieties, that how their kinship is structured, how their society um, is divided into four, and uh, then they cross marry and so forth. So that keeps their genetic integrity. So you learn all these amazing social things as well as the, uh, the physical things from these people. They also have a museum and that museum has uh, improved every year that we've been going there to the stage now where it is a very, very impressive uh, place to visit. And uh, they give stories of, uh, mm. of all different um, subjects and, uh, that are very important to the, uh, the Tiwi Islanders. Again, the plant life, well, that's another story. Every stop we make, we see unique plants and animals, but plants particularly, and of course Aboriginal people relate to these plants in a, in, a, in a quite a special way. So just looking at these six images, I can see um, the, the, uh, the kapok bushes on, on the top right, or top left there. Um, the fluff from those uh, pods, which carries the seeds, floats in the atmosphere, but the Aboriginal men collect that and make body decoration out of that for their ceremonial time. The cycad in the middle at the top, a uh, very toxic plant from the dinosaur age, and yet the Aboriginal people detoxify the fruit and make bread out of it. The water lily on the right, the top right, is food. They eat the flower, they eat the stem, they eat the bulbous roots underneath the, uh, in the mud underneath the, uh, the billabong, and so on, on it goes. They make decorative things out of those little red beads. Uh, even though the beads themselves are quite toxic, Aboriginal people know how to handle and use them. And uh, the grevillea flower on the bottom left and the eucalypt on the bottom right they are all part of the, uh, the, the unique floristic cover that we see when we go around uh, grevilleas providing nectar for all the honey eaters and, and nectar feeding birds and animals and a unique set of gums. Uh, and we explain that as we go along, a whole um, historic, I guess, arrangement of gum trees across Northern Australia, up into New Guinea, uh, down the East Coast. They're all, all interrelated uh, back into history. So we look at all these aspects as we travel along, it's amazing. And of course, all those uh, eucalypts Ian, have uh, adapted to Australian conditions and, mm. and uh, a part, I guess, of the nectar flow. Indeed. You've got uh, plenty of uh, animals, uh, bird life. Uh, uh, you've got plenty of uh, butterflies and, and, uh, uh, and lizards around uh, this area. And we see a large number of them. The, the white-bellied sea, or this one being the juvenile or the uh, uh, immature, uh, looks very different from his um, uh, from his parents, but certainly uh, very very spectacular. The little uh, uh, sunbird, uh, the olive-breasted sunbird down below, uh, has a magnificent nest and uh, very gregarious in uh, nature. And you'll see these all over the place. The hermit crab, of course, is is 
is one of those things where people see a hermit crab and instantly fall in love with it and want to play with it. And, and all of a sudden they find that there's not one, but there's millions of them. And they're all crawling over the rocks and the sand at, at any one time. The butterflies utilize the uh, flowering plants and they're utilizing the nectars. So they're feeding and so you'll get different butterflies at different times of the year. You get plenty of uh, uh, bird life on the caves and on the islands uh, that Ian and I have been talking about. And uh, uh, so they become very important and you get up very close to them and are able to have a look at uh, things. And of course, you can't go past the, the monitor lizards. You get them all over the area, they're different uh, types. Uh, this one I think is probably from Lizard Island and it's why it got its name. Uh, James Cook uh, actually found a whole heap of these uh, uh, monitors and uh, called it uh, Lizard Island. So uh, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, you keep your eyes peeled, you start to see things. That's right, and I guess that's just part of the um, the onshore experience that we always provide. I mean, as you can hear from Jamie and Ian, you know, there's never a shortage of cultural immersion along the way, and that's one of the things that we, you know, we do pride ourselves that we do is, um, you know, it's not just about what you can see um, along the way, but what you can learn, and you know, we do love giving back to all of those communities. So, you know, for example, the little kids, you know, absolutely having a ball on all of those. Um, expedition vessels and um, things like that so you know that there is um, multiple ways that we do give back as well but um, yeah just one of those unique things that we do do um, we always try and have a an afternoon sunset somewhere so whether it's um, on a remote sand cave or on one of the beautiful beaches um, that's always something that we do try and, and include and of course you've got plenty of opportunities for snorkeling as well um, not to mention your diving. Um, we do include kayaks as well. So on those beautiful stops where um, where we were going up at Forbes Island, for example, you can kayak or even off around Lizard. So there's plenty of opportunities to um, to go through there um, and learn about the, the culture along the way. Um, so these vessels here, these are our explorer tenders. So these are actually purpose built by um, Coral Expeditions. So we find that these are one of the best ways to actually get um, into all of those unique beaches. Um, and they're hydraulically lowered off one of those platforms um, from the back of their vessel. So, I mean, I'm sure you'd agree, Jamie and Ian, that these are definitely um, a godsend when you're out on the water. Oh, my word, they are. They, they're most important. Uh, uh, one of the great things about them is that uh, they're covered. Uh, so. Uh, uh, if it's hot, then at least you've got a bit of shade, at least on one side anyway, and you turn the boat around. Uh, you see things all at the same time, so you spin the boat around and everybody gets a chance to have a look at it. And of course, you've got a little marine toilet on board as well, which uh, enables you to, uh, uh, to utilise that particular feature. It also makes it easy to land on beaches, uh, and uh, uh, that way people can uh, uh, get ashore relatively easy. Uh, it also makes it easy on the back of uh, Coral Discoverer in that the, uh, the explorer can be lifted out of the water and so you're never uh, having to get wet feet when you're climbing onto the explorer itself. That's right. I mean, not only is the experience uh, onshore amazing, but um, also on board, we've got that really relaxed type of um, experience. But um, we do have, you know, all the, the bells and whistles, so to speak. Um, we've got fantastic food, which is all chef prepared on board. Um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, morning teas, afternoon teas, you name it. There's never a shortage of, um, of food to be had. Uh, we do include lunch and dinner, um, house beers and wines or house spirits. Um, and then outside of those hours, you can purchase from the multiple bars around the region. So we do have a number of bars on board. Um, but if you don't want to do something like that, you're welcome to go up. Um, we do multiple lectures on board. So maybe Jamie or Ian or one of our other expedition team um, would be up on the deck um, in our bridge deck lounge doing presentations on some of the areas that we do go um, or learning all about the regions that we're actually about to visit. We also allow all of our guests to go up into the bridge. Um, so that's something that's quite unique. Uh, we find that that's probably one of the favourite places that people love to hang out. 
um, is just getting out into the front there. Great place to see all the marine life, um, you know, dolphins riding the bow or, you know, if it's wild migration, things like that, it's a perfect spot. Um, and then also if you just want to learn about um, charting the course, um, you can head up there and, and chart the course with the captain. So um, definitely a, a plenty to do on board. And I also think, uh, Ramona, that, uh, uh, that it's easy to get away from people. You can actually uh, have plenty of room for yourself without even having to go to your, to your uh, cabin. You can find a place where there isn't a lot of people. And I yeah, think that's yeah. uh, one thing that people really enjoy about uh, Coral Discoverer. Absolutely, yeah, that sun deck is amazing. So um, the, the sun deck up in that back left corner, that's a fantastic little spot just to get away with a book. Um, or as you can see, sort of, you know, from the, the vessel image there, there is a, a promenade deck that goes around the ship. So if you want to get some exercise or just go and get a fr some fresh air or take in the views, that's a, a fantastic place to be. Um, and then mm. you've also got plenty of opportunities for view from your room if you do just want to hang out in your room. Uh, we only have 36 staterooms, so it's, she's really quite a small vessel, the Coral Discoverer. Um, but plenty of, as, Ian, um, as Jamie said, sorry, um, plenty of space on board that you can just escape to. Um, so we've either got the choice of uh, bridge deck balcony staterooms, or we've got picture windows, um, or then you've got your portal window. So there's a few different room categories, um, but all with those outside facing views so you can take in all of the, the scenery along the way. Um, so when they designed the Coral Discoverer and also our, our two vessels, which are actually um, a different design, but the Coral Adventure and the Coral Geographer, who do a, a different itinerary. Um, they've kept that in mind where they want to have as many views as possible because there's so many amazing sites to see. So that open dining um, allows you to actually see as much as you can through those windows whilst um, enjoying your meal. And then we've got the Bridge Deck Lounge where we have all of our presentations, etc. Um, and then really relaxed um, type of furnishings as well on board. So um, you've got the bridge deck, as you can see in the top left with those um, large balcony doors. And then you've got your picture windows and your portal windows um, in your next category. So um, she had a refurbishment in um, 2016. Um, so not too long ago. So she's um, looking all lovely and fresh with that really nice coastal relaxed feel to her. So she's a um, beautiful vessel, that one, the Coral Discoverer. I think Jamie and I were on her maiden voyage way back in 2005, and it looks as beautiful to that today to me as it did then, brand new. Did then, yep. She's gorgeous. She's one of my favourites. She's just got that nice, welcoming feel. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So I'm sure along the way you probably heard a few top tips from um, our gentleman there. Um, I know that Ian did mention make sure you pack your binoculars. That is absolutely a must. <laughs> um, mm. But yeah, feel free to share any other um, exciting top tips there, gentlemen, if you've got any additionals there. Well, just make sure you yeah, read the wet landing and dry landing shoes. Make sure you've got wet landing shoes. Most of our uh, landings are going to be wet. Uh, you don't want to wear your leather shoes in there, otherwise they won't be leather any longer. Uh, they'll lose their sole. Um, and uh, uh, so that's very important itself. Make sure you have your cameras too. Uh, don't leave your cameras behind. Uh, that you're going to find, you're going to see uh, shots that you'll never find anywhere again. And it's always a good idea to to make sure that you uh, uh, have a camera. Make sure you bring all the bits and pieces with it. So you know, extra extra cards. Make sure you have your uh, uh, your charges and the like, because uh, not all of us have the same charges. And of course, uh, um, as uh, Ian quite often says to people, we're very uh, fortunate. We take a lot of shots. Other guests quite often take shots. They hand them to the expedition leader. They'll put them all together. And then at the end of the cruise, they're sent uh, through to the company and they are made available to you. So if you don't have a camera, you don't have to worry. You can uh, just download them a little bit later on. Uh, so. Plenty of, uh, plenty of tips in that particular area. Yeah, I think another important one too is um, bring your pre-departure information with you. It always helps to, to know where you need to go, um, but also arriving in that day prior minimum um, and planning to leave a day, prior, um, day post minimum as well. So, I mean, not only is there plenty of places to see in your, your pre-departure, um, 
departure locations, but um, also just, you know, you never know what the weather's going to do. So you just want to make sure you've got that flexibility if for some reason we are coming in a little late or anything due to, you know, unexpected weather and things like that. So, yeah, big one. Always, always plan to be the day prior or day after. And do bring a jacket, ladies and gentlemen. Please bring a bring a uh, a jacket. Uh, winter months and even in the spring months, it can get quite chilly uh, uh, in the early morning, especially if we're going in the Explorer. Uh, so bring a jacket, uh, and that way you won't uh, get too cold. Definitely, and um, always bring that sense of adventure along with you, um, because there's definitely multiple expeditions to be had. So. Uh, we do offer a joining discount, so if you are wanting to do sort of more than one of our itineraries, which do a join, which there is a few that you've got the option to do that with. So our Cape York and Arnhem Land can adjoin to a Kimberley. Um, it can, depending on the, the years, might adjoin to a reef as well. So there's plenty of opportunities. So um, if that is of interest, just make sure that you mention that to our, our friendly reservations team when you do book um, so that you can receive that 10% uh, saving as well. So, I mean, thanks guys. I mean, on behalf of myself and um, and Jamie and Ian. Yes, indeed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you Look for joining us and uh, come and uh, come and have a good time with us.